Hello and welcome to the Enter the Bible podcast where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible but were afraid to ask. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Katie Langston. And today on the podcast, we are delighted to have a very special guest, returning guest, our dear friend, uh, Professor Lois Malcolm. Uh, She is professor of systematic theology at Luther Seminary and a good friend and colleague to both of us. So welcome, Lois. We're so glad to be with us today. It's a delight to be here (laughs) with both of you. Yay. Uh, So today we're addressing a question that we received uh, on our website, and you, dear listener or viewer, if you would like to submit a question, you may do so as well at enterthebible.org. There's a little button at the top that says, ask a question, and feel free to go there. We try to answer as many of these as we can. So this question comes from a listener um, who notes that the story in Luke 7, 36 through 50. And this is when the woman the who is sinful anoints Jesus' feet with alabaster oil. Is that right? Am I getting that with, detail with, right? With ointment in a jar of alabaster. Yeah. Ah, okay. And, and, um, and then forgives her sins. Right. And, um, the people are like, you know, don't you know what kind of a woman this is? And Jesus talks about how, uh, her sins, which are many, have been have been forgiven, and and how much more someone who has been forgiven much uh, loves much. So the question that our listener had said that um, asked does does that passage that story suggest that Jesus' forgiveness of sins encompasses past, present, and future sins? And how does this passage relate to the doctrine of eternal security for believers? Um, or, or what, if anything, does it say about that? Uh, and so we sort of were looking at that and kind of could summarize this question, which is in the context of a very beautiful biblical story. Um, you know, can you lose your salvation uh, once you have received it? Is it something that um, that can go away? Or does the forgiveness of sin that is given to you um, through Christ lasts forever, no matter what. So Lois, tell us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. How come I get the hard ones? Yeah. 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 We say say the hard ones for our friends, Lois. That's right. That's right. This is one of the classic (laughs) questions Um, in the late 19th century, the Norwegian immigrant synods who came to the U.S. were divided precisely over these que- over this particular question, and most sure. Christian denominations um, have been divided over this question: um, Is salvation completely unconditional, right. or do our choices and our decisions affect our salvation, and is is our salvation secure? Unfortunately, scripture always gives us complicated responses because you can find, you can find scripture, for example, in Paul's letters. Paul says in first, second uh, Corinthians five, one has died for all, therefore all have died. And then also in first Corinthians 15, Paul talks about how all will be raised in Christ so that Christ's death and resurrection does in fact affect all of us, that God's offer of salvation is there for all. Okay. On the other hand, Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 5 to say, one has died for all, therefore all have died, but so that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Hmm. And so that on the other hand, you have this sense that yes, grace is there for everyone. Christ's death is there to release all of us from death as well as from sin. But that's not just there so that we have insurance in the bank, okay? It's not just there so that we can then, you know, we don't have to worry about God anymore. We don't have to worry about loving our neighbors anymore. No, the whole point of that unconditional love and the whole point of knowing that death and sin and the powers of of hell, the demonic powers, have been overcome in Jesus' death is precisely so that we can be freed to live, as Paul would say um, in Galatians 5, 6, so that the hope of righteousness is faith working out in love. Mm 
so that we're called to live in that hope that, in fact, all will be all in God, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. I have a lot more to say, but why don't you guys push back or or let me know where to go (laughs) from here? Well, uh, those promises are, are wonderful, right? Uh, I, you, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, right? Very important to, to Martin Luther. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, right? It is it, even faith itself is a gift, right? Right. Uh, and, and Martin Luther, of course, famously uh, worried and worried and worried and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, when he was still a, a monk, was uh, uh, you know uh, confessing all of his little tiny sins, right, and wearing hair shirts and that sort of thing. And then he comes to this breakthrough revelation that even faith itself is a gift, and that and that uh, God's grace is sufficient. Uh, uh, that God's grace is more than enough, right? That that we are right. saved not not by our works, not by our uh, acts, uh, but by God's uh, God's free gift of grace, and that is a, a beautiful uh, a beautiful gift, uh, especially to those who are raised in traditions where uh, they're told over and over again that they have to be worthy of God's salvation, that they have to do something. Right? That's a that's a great gift. Uh, right. Yes, that was my story. So yes, exactly. So I'm going to push back a bit, though, right? Sure. Uh, and I wonder, so, uh, well, first of all, I think we have to say it's up to God, right? We right. we we rely on God's mercy. We are not the judges of <laughs> of, of others. Uh, we don't know what's in their hearts uh, and that we leave them to God's mercy. But when, when I, so when I was a pastor in Wisconsin, uh, I did several funerals, of course. I was a pastor for over five years and, uh, and some of them were really difficult, right? Like, uh, like the guy who, who abused his wife and uh, was an alcoholic and then committed suicide, right? Like, what do you say at a funeral like that? And, and that's, you know, I never, you know, never darkened the door of a church in his life, uh, but had been baptized, right? He had been baptized as an infant. Now, in those, in those situations, right, I think it's more a matter of pastoral discernment and pastoral care than it is about uh, right, or, you know, systematic theology. So, right. you know, you just put him into God's hands. You, you leave him to God's mercy. You talk about his baptism. But, and, and I think that's the important thing to do. But I wonder, you know, if someone is baptized, but then that baptism, that faith uh, doesn't seem to have any discernible effect on their lives, right? right. I, 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 I'm not sure, right? I, I, I would, I would probably lean towards. Uh, obviously, we leave them to God's mercy. But I'm not sure that that person is is saved to use that word. Right. What and yeah, and here's and here's where we get at a very um, a very poignant fact, which is about what all of our talk about God is about. Okay, which is that we can't make. You know, when we're talking about scientific facts, so to speak, you can prove it empirically or you can when you're when you have a mathematical formula, you can prove that rationally. But any kind of a theological statement is about God who completely is beyond our our insight beyond. And it is not for us in any way to know what's in God's heart, do, do you know, in the sense, right. in mm-hmm. aside from what God tells us, which is mm-hmm. that God is love, but God is also a God of justice. Okay, so we know right. those two pieces. Mm-hmm. But the way that we can make statements about God, and that's why I really liked when you said your response is a pastoral response, because quite frankly, as I say to my students, all of your theological statements are going to be as ephemeral as these three things, faith, hope, and love. Any kind of a theological statement, and even a statement about what happens to us after death, 
Okay, we don't know empirically what happens after death, but we do have God's promises mm -hmm. and we do have God's law. So we, those are mm -hmm. the two things that we always have to rely on. And in between God's law, which is that there are consequences for our actions and God's promises, guess where you and I live? We live in faith where we cling back to the promises. I, I always say to my students, we fall back in the promises and we live in hope where we step into the promises. So the only kind of attitude, quite frankly, that we can have and the only kind of statement that we can make for anyone, whether they have been a good person or a bad person about their eternal salvation and even about our own right. is in the act of prayer. It's in the act of faith. It's in the hope, it's in the prayer that God, let your mercy and let your will be done. Let your justice and mercy be done. And mm -hmm. so what we do is hold up both sinners and saints right. into the hand of God. Because the question can be asked just as much as to why does God allow innocent people to suffer? The same mm -hmm. kind of question I know as, as pastors, you've experienced with say an innocent baby who dies or somebody mm -hmm. who's innocent, who, who, who is a victim of somebody else's actions. But in both cases, it's kind of like, God, where are you? Where is right. your justice, whether with the sinner or the saint? And our prayer is God, let your justice and your mercy and let your character permeate our world so that we now can treat one another with your justice and mercy. So it's in the the only way we can respond to that is in it's in the act of faith and trust that in fact this is in God's hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the limit of what we can say. This is where Luther says, "Let's not talk about the hidden God." You know what I mean? Let's yeah. let's simply yeah, yeah. talk about the God we know, who is a God both of command, the Ten Commandments, and of promises. Yeah, go ahead. Where's the place of repentance? Yes. Okay. This is where, this is where, yes, um, repentance is really, really crucial. The whole reason that we have been given this gift, this gift of faith is not so that we can have a ticket to heaven. Um, as Luther makes clear in his treatise on the freedom of the Christian, guess why we've been given the word which frees us from from sin and death and pain, precisely so that we can keep God's promises. And this is, I think, something that we've forgotten, especially as Christians. I think Jews understand this more. But as Christians, we've forgotten that the whole reason we're saved is not so that we can have a ticket to heaven, even right. though, yes, our eternal unity and dwelling with God is secure. The whole reason we are saved is so that we can be released from sin and so that we can do the two things that we're called to do. We're only called, as human beings, we're only called to do two things, love God and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and so th that's why we're saved. It's so we can attend to the neighbor's needs and so that we can be freed from our own fear and anxiety so that we can live into what God has called us to do and be so that we can serve our families and our communities and the institutions that we work for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, these sorts of questions, uh, make me want to ask the deeper question well what what do what do we mean by salvation right yeah, yeah like yeah. are we are we talking about um you know uh like you were saying a ticket to heaven or are we talking about uh a life that is transformed in christ by the power of the holy spirit and uh that a, a person who is set free to live and love uh, in the present, which is the only moment that we actually have at any given time, right? Uh, to love and serve our neighbors. And I think that, um, that the ultimate um, fate, I guess, of people in, in the world to come it is a mystery and and we we leave that to god but for ourselves you know um we can one um trust and have security that god will do what he said he would do um and two um you know we can from that space of of trust and assurance then live as redeemed saved 
people here and now. Um, and that's probably more important than, you know, than living for the next life. I think God gives us our salvation so that we can live better now at, in anticipation of the future that's coming. Um, and it's not just like a sort of next life focus. And I think for some reason, uh, it feels like American Christianity in particular has been very, very, very next life focused. Mm. And I don't want to diminish the next life. I remember sure, sure. giving a talk once and and somebody who was, he was older. He Both he yeah. and his wife sure. were older and they were sure. expecting death. And he said, right. mm-hmm. You know, the re- the preaching of the resurrection is really important to me. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right now, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I don't yeah. want to negate yeah. the fact that we will, in fact, be raised with Christ and we right. will, in fact, live with God and with one another in a new creation. So we don't want to negate that. But the whole reason we can hope for that promise is so that here and now, as you're saying, Katie, so that we can, in fact, be freed to live out of eternal life now. I, I also see two, there's sort of two things going on in, in our conversation, right? Where the, um, where the question is actually about, can I have security in my salvation? Mm. Yes. And, and then what we're extrapolating from that is, well, can everyone then have assurance mm-hmm. in their salvation? Mm-hmm. And I think for the person who's asking that question, yes, you can have assurance in your salvation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm you can know that um you know that 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 you have been baptized you have been claimed you have been named um god is promising you forgiveness of sin and there's not a sin that god will not forgive <laughs> right there's mm-hmm. not a thing you can do um that nothing can separate you, you from the love of God. Right. Nothing yeah. can separate you. So, so in in our own lives, we can cling to that promise, absolutely and fully. And for people who maybe have not lived um, in such a way that they've even wondered about it, or you know, maybe they have lost or or rejected even um, the promises of God, you know. Um, those are the questions that we can be we can be hopeful about, and leave others right to the mercy of of God, and not try to make a decision one way or and that's way above our pay grade to make a decision one way or another <laughs> about the. But we can pray for people, but and we I, can yes, pray. Yes, right. yes. Right. We are called to intercessory prayer for everyone right. in yeah. our circle. You know, right. um, I you know we're. I'm not going to go so far as to say that we pray for the dead. Protestants don't do that. But right. nonetheless, we are called to pray for... We can pray for the dead. We probably just don't pray to them, right? But right. Um, as Protestants... But can, right. But we, we're, we're, called to, for, we're called to a ministry of intercessory prayer. Yeah. 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 And, so, uh, and, um, oh. so I would just say, like, so, so you yourself, you, questioner, person who submitted this question, like, you, yes, can have... Right. Security right. in the promises of God because they're unconditional and right. and they're for you and and you can trust that right. He will do what He said He would would do. Um right. and um and we can be hopeful uh about the whole world. That that's right. how I, yeah. I exactly that's how I think about it. Right. I, I have deep hope <laughs> right. that all may be saved, right? Yeah. Yeah. If I could, I, I completely agree with what you just said, Katie and Lois, too, that uh, uh, the, 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 if, if the question is, and, and of course, we're trying to extrapolate what the questioner asks. If the question is, can I be assured of my salvation? Is God, will God forgive, you know, past, present and future sins? Yes. Amen. Yes, uh, absolutely. You can be assured of salvation. Uh I just I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be maybe devil's advocate maybe that's not the right phrase but no, so my literally the devil's advocate you're literally advocating for the devil <laughs> to have some of these people go on you're, you're seeping into the next question anyway, go, go on <laughs> so my my husband Doug Stanky uh, who is who is also a ELCA pastor uh, Lutheran pastor he and I have had this discussion a few times and. 
he tends to be probably more where you are, Lois. Like, a, a, what? I, I don't know if this is a fair term, but like a Christian universalist. Like Christian, obviously, in the sense that all are saved through Christ, right? right. Uh, uh, I I tend to think, and maybe this is my. I don't know, my sense of fairness, right? Or my my immersion in the Old Testament with its its right. concern for justice. I tend to think that if people, if a if a person uh hears the gospel and rejects it, uh if a person chooses deliberately uh to be aligned with the forces of death, right, and and uh and rejects God. I tend to think that God may honor that choice in the next life, right? That, that, that we can choose to be separated from God. Um, and, and maybe again, that's just my sense of just, like, right. just to, like if God doesn't, uh, if there aren't consequences for evil right. uh, acts, then where is justice? That's, that's my own feeling. Right. My husband, my husband, says, you know, it's a mystery, all will be saved through Christ. And I said, well then well then why should we why should we share the gospel? And he had this great answer. He said, because they should know it in this life, right? They should know that they'll be that that they have life and salvation in this life, which I, I think is a good answer. I, but having said that, I totally agree with you, Katie, that we leave others in God's hands uh, and yeah. trust in God's in God, both God's justice and God's mercy, and you said that too, Lois. And and just to support what you've said, Catherine. I mean, I just I because even Paul, who is often used as the example of God's unconditional love for everyone, even Paul makes it very clear, for example, in second, in, right before he says one died for all, therefore all have died, several verses before that, he says that we will be held accountable for the mm. deeds that we have done in our body, right. that even right. though mm. we will all be raised with Christ and we will be presented before God, we will be judged before mm-hmm. the judgment seat of Christ. And I have no mm-hmm. idea what that means, mm-hmm. but there is no question that even Paul, <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean, who is the who is the number one person who wants to emphasize justification by faith alone, even he emphasizes that we will be held accountable. And the the other big piece that I think we've lost, um, especially in Western American Christianity, and I think Katie was pointing this out, that, and this ties in with your comment about Catherine, your point about repentance, Catherine. The whole point about being saved is so that we can repent, and repent simply means turn around, right. so yeah. that we can change. And that's why yeah. I think the God, proclaiming the gospel is so important that, yes, God's promises are there for everybody, precisely so that we can turn around. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and we can turn around as individuals, as families, as societies, so that God's justice and mercy can prevail in our relationships with one another, yeah. Um, yeah, both yeah. in this life and in the next. And because there are real consequences, like, for mm-hmm. example, in the environment, as we're seeing right now, you know, right. or if you're unfaithful right. to somebody, you're probably going to destroy a marriage. You know what I mean? Right, and right, maybe right, right. Your family. If you mm-hmm. neglect your children, I mean, there really are consequences. And right. yes, there is forgiveness, but the forgiveness, the purpose of forgiveness is not a ticket to heaven. The purpose of forgiveness is repentance, right. which mm-hmm. is metanoia, turning mm-hmm. around, turning or around. Mm-hmm. yeshuva, you know, which is turning around. It's it's yeah. changing yeah, your yeah. direction. Yeah. And I, no, I think that's... that's what we need to emphasize in, yeah. in what grace is. So, yeah, so that we don't fall into the trap of cheap grace, right? As Dietrich Bonhoeffer, cheap grace, right? Right. With, right. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. I, what we do doesn't matter because everything's going to be fine in the end. Like that's right. that's a sort of yeah, the nihilism almost, right? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. But even Christians need to hear that too. I mean, right. this is what I like about Luther because Luther preaches the gospel not just to non-believers, but to people who have been baptized, that we need right. to return again and again right. to to the to hear and eat the promises in, in Holy Communion and hear them in the word preached, because we need to be transformed right. so that we exactly. can actually love our neighbors. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and forgive I, others. Yeah. 
I, I want to go back to something you said right at the beginning, Lois, that, that uh, scripture has comp- a complicated answer to this question. Mm-hmm. And I, I can just imagine some of our listeners right now going, but what about, you know, Matthew 25, which you mentioned, yes. right? What about right. Uh, Revelation? What about other passages? Mm-hmm. I, I just want to acknowledge there are passages in scripture, Matthew 25, Very the sheep clear. and the goats, right? Uh, the book of Revelation, the uh, other passages. Uh, Passages in in the Gospels, particularly that talk about uh, well, the rich man and Lazarus, right? Uh, sure. The uh, right. weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, uh, so there are there are passages that would seem to indicate that both in this life and the next life there are consequences for unbelief right. and for injustice and 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 right. all of that. So I just want to acknowledge that and say yeah. that there are these passages that Lois has talked about too, particularly in the epistles of Paul that, uh, that, that indicate that God's, uh, God's grace is unconditional, uh, and that salvation is unconditional. So, so God's mercy is always there when we repent. I mean, that's the paradox is that there is this, it's, it isn't divorced from repentance. Right. Right. I kind of like, so I don't, I don't, uh, call myself necessarily a universalist because I don't know. Yeah. I call myself hopeful. Yeah. Um, I, right? I would like to use that language. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I, I call myself yes. hopeful, uh, uh, hopeful that all will be reconciled. But I'll just share this. This is sort of how I've come to think about it just in my own life. Like, if you ask the question, you know, is, is there a hell? Uh, I think yes because I, you know, I have spent time there, (laughs) right? Like, I know what it's like to wonder all the time if you're good enough and if you're saved and if you're worthy. And I know what it's like to feel like you have to take it all on yourself and, like, you are the one who determines, like, what happens. And my experience of grace has been of God pursuing me even when I wasn't listening or open until the point that something broke open and I was able um, through God's grace to turn to God. Right. And so, uh, and, and, and trust in the promises of unconditional love and mercy and salvation. And so I kind of think of it in terms of like, um, and again, this is all speculation, right? Just sort of taking the bits of biblical evidence that we have and experience as Christians and people of faith or whatever, like, is it, you know, is it possible that there are people who have rejected God um, despite God's pursuing? And is it possible that, you know, God will continue to pursue those people into the next life and they'll continue to reject God and live in that hell of, you know, fear and doubt and whatever, self-centeredness, whatever, um, I think that is possible. I think that is a possibility. Um, But I think my hope comes from the idea that God will never stop pursuing Mm. everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That that is, God continues to pursue. and, And so if God is continuing to pursue someone, You know, and again, this is speculation. I'm speculating here, but if God continues to pursue us even after this life, does ultimately God not get what he wants? I I think that's hard. That's why I'm hopeful. It's hard to say that God doesn't win (laughs) that pursuit in the end. Mm. Right. But, um, but I do, yeah, definitely know what the pain and, um, like torment really of being separated from God feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, so I would never say there's no such thing as hell because I think I know a little bit of what it, what it is. Um, and so, yeah. And so that's when I say I'm, I'm hopeful. That's, that's what my hope is that, 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 um, that God's pursuit ultimately, you know, is effective and triumphant no matter how long it takes. 
but that we can create our own health. That that position, um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is a 20th century Roman Catholic, has written um, several books on that. Yeah, I, I just read Dare We Hope. Argument. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, dare we hope? That's his. Mm-hmm. That that's I and I think that, that's yeah, that a very. Good. That's one of the best um, statements because it's not an easy universalism on the right. one hand, right. but right. it does affirm God's unconditional justice, which gives us freedom in a sense to reject God's right. unconditional justice, but also God's unconditional love and promise. Yeah. And it's a big question, but I think, you know, for our listener who submitted this, the fact that you're worried about it, I think, says, don't worry so much, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, leave Hitler to God, but you... Right. <laughs> right. Seriously, right? Yeah. You, the person who submitted this question, have confidence yeah. in the promises of forgiveness when Christ died for you and has claimed you and has saved you, you can take that to the bank. Right. Take that to the bank and live out of that assurance and that hope um, because Christ is merciful and there's no unforgivable sin and you can rest assured um, in your salvation. So I would, that's what I would say in some amen um, amen yeah that's beautiful katie yeah Yeah, Yeah. so wow but huge question and i'm sure listeners are going to disagree or whatever with some of the things that we've said that's fine that's awesome um uh, it's just important right that's why we say we're um uh we're not answering questions we're reflecting (laughs) some of these questions we won't know this side of this side of heaven um, in full. But until then, we have hope. And thank you so much for being with us today, Lois. And thank you for um, tuning in to our listeners and viewers. Um, If you enjoyed this episode of uh, Enter the Bible, uh, we would invite you to uh, give us a review, though they really help um, on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app. Five stars is great. I'm just saying. Um, And... uh, Of course, you can always go to enterthebible.org for more great resources and conversations like this. Um, Until next time, thanks for being with us.